Okay, let's uh, let's start. So welcome to everyone on behalf of the Cities Alliance and uh, CMR to this uh, event, Women Leaders of the Frontline. Uh, let me start by saying why we are uh, we have organized this uh, this event today uh, with the Cities Alliance, which is a global partnership. Uh, promoting inclusive and equal urban de development worldwide. We are proactively, in fact, supporting women's leadership uh, at the local level in local governance, which translates then into the design of services and spaces that better respond to everyone's need. So for us, the question of gender equality at the local level is really uh, a priority. And uh, in our work, especially in the recent years, that have been, unfortunately, as everyone knows, characterized by wars, conflict, a global pandemic, uh, frequent climate shocks, we have been called to deal with emergency. So our work, in fact, our core work is development, but in fact, more and more development is connected to humanitarian aid. So it's a very new uh, terrain also for us in, in which we have to operate, the emergency. And uh, normally, in fact, when we look at crisis and disasters, it is always women and girls that are the most affected and exposed to uh, the risks and the shocks, uh, being in fact the ones that have less control over resources and they're one mostly responsible for care work at those household, household level, the community level. So they have less capacity to cope, in fact, with shocks and disasters. Uh, this event uh, today is also a continuation of an investigation and work that we conducted since a um, few months ago, uh, together with uh, StreetNet International and Vigo, that I think they are also joining today, um, in Ukraine, to understand and collect uh, the experiences, the daily life, the needs of women in, in Ukrainian cities right now. And in fact, it's a perspective uh, on the war that we often don't get to know. Um, the, the journalist Vetlana Alexievich said, everything we know about the war, we know with a man's voice, with a man's face. And in fact, it's true that women's voices often go unheard in the media, but also in peacekeeping negotiations. And we will talk about this today. Uh, so in this work in Ukraine, we have realized even more, we have seen it also during the COVID crisis in cities across the world, but even more now in Ukraine, that women are playing in reality a key role in the resistance, but also in supporting, in keeping the communities in fact together. Um, and the women that we have interviewed expressed also the need of connecting with other women in leadership position in other countries that have experienced or are right now going through uh, recovery processes and crisis and emergency. So it's very important also to share this experience to create almost a community to work together and to support each other. And in fact, as the Cities Alliance, we want to facilitate facilitate that, no? to amplify the voices, to amplify the actions of women leaders on the ground. So the, the event today has, I think, twofold objective. The first one is really to understand the gender implications of emergencies and crises and pri priorities for action. And the second one is to promote the inclusion and leadership of women in the recovery decision-making process. So today we have representatives from uh, different contexts, different geographies, that I think they share, in fact, one key challenge. How cities and women's uh, leaders in particular can respond to short-term needs of their community, of the most vulnerable, why, without forgetting the long-term objective of inclusion and inequality. And in fact, is also, a good occasion also for myself and for us, I think, to learn from this experience, because it's a very, as I said, a new terrain for us, and we need to, uh, to adapt and to, to be able to give the right support to women's leaders at the local level. So I warmly uh, welcome our speakers today. Um, we have, uh, we can start, we will start with uh, Natalia Kolchenkova, which has been already with us, 
in, a, in an event that we have recently organized in Brussels with the European representatives. She's the head of international relations at the city of Cherniv in Ukraine. So welcome, Natalia. And then uh, we will hear uh, about Haiti. Uh, we have today with us, I think someone has, needs to mute. Like we can hear the voice. Um, sorry. Uh, so we have uh, Richelle Fortunus, which is the councillor of the city of Cap Haitian, Haiti. She's participating, but she is a bit sick. So probably her, uh, a speech or intervention will be read by, by another colleague. And then we'll have, uh, we have Elisa Oja, which is a professor of architecture at the University of Pristina and member of the parliament in Kosovo. Uh, then we have Tetiana um, Melink, Melnik, expert of municipal infrastructure recovery, and also part of the Association of Ukrainian Cities. Uh, then we continue with Katarina Kresal, which is the founder of European Center for Dispute Resolution. She's also part of the Mediterranean uh, Women Mediators Network. And, and then we end up with uh, uh, Renata Kozic, which is the mayor of uh, Domžale in Slovenia. So um, before giving the floor to the first speaker, I want us to say that this is a public event. So this uh, will be recorded and the recording will be also shared. So we will touch upon, I think, very some sensitive topic. So just to give you the, the context. And then, um, and then, yes, if you, we have the translators in Ukrainian and also in French. So if you want to follow, there is the, the icon of the word, you can click on it and you can select the preferred language. So I give now the floor to Natalia and uh, to hear about the current situation in, uh, in, in Ukraine and in our cities and what are the key priorities right now. Thank you, Natalia. Yeah. Good afternoon. Do you hear me clearly? Is it okay? Yes? Yes. yes. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you for this great event. It's a great honor for me to share the experience of the city of Chernihiv. Uh, just a couple of words about my city. It is in the north of Ukraine, uh, in the border with Russia and Belarus. And from the first minute of the war, Chernihiv felt the whole horror of the war attacking by all kinds of weapons, by artillery, uh, bombing, sh shelling, and so on. Um, Chunihi was damaged and ruined a lot. And from the first minute of the war, all residents of Chunihi united. Men took the weapon in their hands and went to defend the city. And it was about for, for women to organize our life in this uh, wartime, hard time. There were no shelters. We were not kind of shelters and arranged the life in these uh, new circumstances. I mean, to take care of our children, to provide any kind of security, to provide food, to provide clothes. It was rather cold and uh, it was up to women to uh, to support our men who went to war and to provide them also with all kinds of supply. Uh, I have bright examples of our women who, um, uh, who act as like volunteers. And this movement, volunteer mo movement, started a year ago. And now the uh, women are the leaders, I can say, in this, um, uh, in this activity. And we help starting with uh, food, small supplies to uh, buying and managing to deliver to the frontline drones and uh, uh, very hard equipment, military equipment. Uh, what I want to uh, say, I represent municipality, uh, local, uh, local city council, Geneva city council. And I want to emphasize the great role of municipality in defending our residents and now in the way of recovery. As the city of Chernihiv was damaged a lot, we had a simultaneous task to make recovery and repair of uh, dwellings, of houses, of critical infrastructure, social infrastructure, 
and we had to do it in very quick terms because we had to prepare for heating season. Um, and um, the first priority, one of the first priority, of course, uh, after providing repairs of dwelling, it was to open schools because we understand open schools and kindergartens because we understand if uh, no school, no education, so uh, we, we can uh, return our uh, residents back to the city because a lot of residents left the city uh, because of hostility. So it was very uh, difficult task because a lot of educational institutions, schools, kindergartens were ruined about 80% general number, but uh, we did it because we wanted uh, our children, first of all, to get education, and the second, to give our parents and first of all, women, opportunity to work and to provide uh, normal, uh, normal style of life to take care of uh, children. Uh, the same is for kindergartens. We understand that it's, it is very difficult for, we, for women, who majority of them just stay alone. Their husbands are at the war and they have to manage uh, their work, taking uh, care of children and a lot of other tasks. So uh, I should say that it's very important uh, and very um, important step was to uh, provide any kind of normal uh, normal life to return to normal life for, for residents and for women, first of all. Um, what I want to, uh, to add, um, unfortunately, the city of Chernihiv is on the uh, border, as I said, with Russia and Belarus, and a lot of enterprises and business uh, companies also suffered a lot, and many people lost their job. And it was uh, also a very hard task to uh, provide support for business uh, to, uh, to, to give them opportunity to recover. Uh, unfortunately, uh, women also uh, like uh, one of the categories of uh, residents who suffered, who lost job, who had to take care of children. And it was like a double or triple pressure uh, at the same time. Uh, so uh, one of the tasks we have to solve, the problem we had to solve to provide, and we are doing it at the moment, uh, looking for any kind of supporting uh, women uh, entrepreneurship, because in these circumstances, uh, I should say it also a um, leading part of women to open middle, uh, to open small size businesses, uh, middle sized businesses, and it's also very important to give uh, and to find different programs, different kinds of um, um, programs for supporting women in their uh, working, uh, in their work, and opening new businesses. And what is very important to uh, study, to get new professions, to new skills, because um, a lot of them lost uh, old jobs. And uh, it's um, a good uh, variant to provide uh, new studies, uh, new opportunities to have uh, new skills and new knowledges for maybe to changing the job and to start a new uh, profession. Um, but um, returning to the, uh, to the position of the women, I want to, to tell that uh, it's a huge psychological um, pressure that women are experiencing. And now when um, it is time maybe to uh, receive any help of, uh, from psychologists or uh, any kind of um, uh, doctors, unfortunately, women don't have time for it. Uh, and even they neglecting their physical health. And I can say that uh, we have such certs and unfortunately it's the same with me that it's no time for us to take care of myself, to get any psychological support, any help, or even to go to the doctor just to check my health because it is war and I, I have many difficult uh, other tasks to, to, to solve the problems. And I want to mention that we have to find such approaches to uh, attract women to make Треба було знайти якийсь розв'язок і якось довести uh, ментально і фізично. Uh, 
Parce qu'il faut être... to resist and to take care of our uh, closer of our children. Uh, one of the more issues I want to uh, also note, it is about our veterans. Uh, you understand what I mean? Our men uh, started to return home. Unfortunately, many of them uh, need treatment. Unfortunately, many of them have injuries. And uh, it's a new issue for uh, all our society, but the main uh, responsibility it is for women when their husbands, their uh, brothers, their fathers return from war. It is a new, um, a new uh, period in the family. Uh, it's new relations because war changes people hugely. And uh, many uh, people who return from war, they also need uh, psychological treatment, physical treatment. And now we are in the situation when uh, our warriors started to return home and we need such a complex maybe program uh, to implement, uh, which will support families and families should understand that it's important to use such programs to study how to, uh, to behave because for our society and uh, during the war, it's also like, it's not important. So we will uh, manage to do it uh, ourselves, but unfortunately it's a problem. And I think we should uh, think of some ways of, uh, of solving such, uh, or not to predict uh, problems in the families. We should think of any kind of programs for such kind of uh, uh, relations. Um, so, but in general, just I want to 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 say to say that the war, in my opinion, uh, changed or started to change the image of the women uh, in our uh, society in our country because if before the women was like more um, not a housekeeper, of course, it uh, women uh, and pre-war. Uh, played, started to play um, significant role in social life and economical and so on, political. But now our women, uh, they don't want to feel like victims of the war. They want to take part in the uh, gaining victory and to, uh, unfortunately, not all of us can take a weapon to take arm and go to the front line. But I'm totally sure that uh, the majority of our women um, they just defend their own front line, educational, medicine, social, cultural, and all other spheres. Um, because uh, women feel that they can and they do their best to also have ro have a role, role in the victory of this war. So this is very important and nowadays when it is the process of recovery starts. I want to say that we need some a strategic plan for it because we have passed the first, uh, uh, the first stage of recovery, uh, just short term, yes, uh, emergency one. And there was no, um, no time for analysis for unfortunately providing an agenda uh, approach or so on, because we have to do it quickly uh no recommendations no advice no time for it and now when we started to think about uh, strategic recovery long-term recovery uh, we should um, develop such programs or uh, as for me i'm uh, very interested in the uh, topic of uh, gender equality and providing gender equality but unfortunately on the municipal levels there are no such um, maybe uh, much experiences um, uh, at the municipal uh, councils and authorities. And also it's a great issue for all of us to make like analysis and plan and uh, for uh, every city to now, before we start long-term recovery and strategic uh, recovery, to implement these approaches. So this is where we need help and need European experience. So uh, the main thing I want to finish my speech is that uh, it is a few of a huge importance, such meetings, sharing experiences. And we, uh, Ukrainian women, who now continue to resist, uh, 
together, all together, we also can share some experiences of our, uh, maybe I, I say it in general, of Ukrainian women, of our uh, bravery, resistance, leadership, because you know that I once mentioned that um, bravery has no gender. <laughs> so we can also maybe, um, uh, as we need help, so the same, we also can share some of our experience and all together we can, I think, uh, unite and uh, play a huge role in the women's leadership. So this is my idea. Thank you very much, Natalia, for your, um, for your, for your intervention and also just sharing your experience. And I think you touch upon very important points. Uh, also, the, I think the changing role of women in this uh, very like this very difficult moment and the need of integrating the gender aspect into also kind of long term or medium term planning and not only emergency both. I think you you touch upon important and the aspect of capacity. So the important role of municipality, but also the need of capacity support. And maybe I, I take from, from this point, I will give the floor to Elisa Oja. That I, I, I can imagine that coming from a country, Kosovo, which also faced a, a very recent also war, I was wondering if you can share also if you have faced similar challenges that the ones that uh, Natalia just shared, and how what did you learn? So what did work well in terms of also gender sensitive recovery? and what he didn't work. Thank you. You are on mute. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to all of you. Uh, very pleased to be a part of this uh, event. Uh, I will try to share some of my personal experience, professional experiences, and but also uh, some of the uh, uh, important moments uh, that Kosovo went through and the woman in that, uh, in that uh, picture, the role of woman in that picture. I belong to a generation who, was, who, was, who were persecuted from the educational system because the war in Kosovo was not the same as in Ukraine. Uh, it's a different context. Kosovo was a part of Yugoslavia. And then within that uh, 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 spatial uh, structure, uh, you know all the wars from Slovenia to, to Kosovo, which was the last one in the decade of the 90s. Uh, actually, we, we first faced the 10 year of exclusion, which meant exclusion uh, from the public sphere. Uh, first, from the education uh, system, which was uh, you could stay in school, but you could learn only in Serbian and only the curricula, which is for Serbian history, literature and everything else, which meant that we left the schools and uh, uh, people of Kosovo mobilized and they created a parallel system of education, which was hosted in the private, private homes, private houses in the periphery of the city, especially Pristina as a capital city, was a city that mobilized to create this net of uh, small uh, boxes and spaces in the private areas for public uh, uh, amenities. This meant that the whole uh, sort of layer of the city uh, the pattern of the city and movement and the, the, the functions of the city changed because if, if you could if you would analyze the city of the 90s uh, from the perspective of uh, Serbs and Albanians living in the same city, so you could see that the pattern of movement and the patterns of use is totally different. So for us, the center and the public was not ours. It was just a transit area while our public life was in the periphery. So the periphery was our center. <laughs> so we could kind of use uh, uh, private houses to kind of feed ourselves with. Uh, and this happened the same uh, with the uh, uh, organization that was created, Motra Ciriazi, uh, uh, the sister Ciriazi, which meant uh, for the need uh, of the health sector, also the health sector to be in the parallel system. And then Media Center, which was created also by two great women journalists. This is pre-war situation, totally. And to be open up uh, in the very difficult time when the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army, came into being in 1997, when then the, uh, uh, the situation got very radical, uh, sort of... Uh, plus radical. The... The manifestations were more radical. What happened in this moment, at this moment, how would I say? C'était un moment très spécifique et très sensible au Kosovo. 
C'était une période vraiment difficile. Et il y avait une forme d'ouverture euh, liée au genre parce que les hommes étaient très persécutés de différentes manières. На чоловіків були таке полювання, можна сказати, і тоді жінки прийняли на себе цей виклик і отримали. In the 5th of March, and then it was a protest with bread. If you remember the images of that time, woman, uh, it was it was a march to to go from Pristina to uh, to Skandera municipality of Skandera because it was totally isolated, with idea to send bread there and also help uh, 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 amenities. Uh, but it, but it was stopped by the Serbian police. But then also in the 8th of March, the 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 women's protest uh, with the white sheet. For more, for uh, calling for peace, also the 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 the, the protest uh, with uh, candles for many uh, many Albanians coming back uh, home uh, in in uh, uh, killed, uh, which was serving to the to the to the army and stuff like that. But but then after even during the war, but also uh, while we were deported for three months out of Kosovo, half of Kosovo people were deported. And they were hosted by Macedonia, Albania, and Montenegro as refugees in the border areas or in the uh, in the camps. There were a lot of women working in the issues of uh, missing persons, but spe specifically in the sexually abused uh, 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 categories. Uh, the, here, I can talk about uh, an NGO which which is which is which was created since from the camps. In, in, in Albania, and this is the lady Feride Rushiti, who leads the uh, Kosovo, uh, Kosovo Center for uh, uh, Torture and, Reha and uh, Rehabilitation and Torture and vic uh, for Victims, which is still operating today and still collecting stories of, uh, of uh, sexually abused victims, which were not uh, uh, an issue that was not discussed even after the war in Kosovo for more than 12 years. So for the first time, the story of sexually abused victims was opened up in the parliament of Kosovo. And then there was a deputy who was uh, a man deputy who was saying that this is our shame, this case should be closed. And this was a moment when I also created a project, which was an exhibition and, and a multimedia project to kind of reflect on women living in silence for so many years being victims of the war and also being stigmatized and not being able to talk and to share their stories and to kind of relieve their pain and be accepted in their families, but also in society because of the war. And it's still today. It's a different story a bit, but it's still going on today. Due to that, we had, uh, we had visits also from Ukraine, uh, ladies from Ukraine different uh, uh, recently. Uh, to talk about this this uh, big project that Kosovo has uh, is a is a successful case how they treat it and how it's going on as a pro as a process and as a as a project uh, generally and also what Kosovo did because we know how it is to be colonized to be expelled to be to live in the war to live in the pre-war to live after in, in post-war situation which many things could happen also recently as a state we created a space for 10 journalists from Ukraine to come to Kosovo, not as refugees, but just to be, to come to Kosovo to feel safe and then to have their home, I mean, their places where to, where to live and then to be integrated in, in the Kosovo uh, uh, radio television of Kosovo as a part of, of uh, to do their job uh, uh, concerning, uh, contributing to their country, Ukraine. I can, uh, I can, I can uh, uh, only name the Ludmila uh, Maki, one of the one of the journalists that I meet. I mean, uh, often actually in many cultural events, uh, also not just very professional events. Uh, she's very active here together with, but also as uh, as I'm a part also of the Women Alliance in the Parliament. Uh, 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 we also met them, and we heard a lot of stories uh, from them due to the war. Uh, what's going on in Ukraine? What I wanted to say is that in this case, Kosovo created uh, this. Uh, social mobilization of Kosovo created this net where women kind of found or refound their roles to contribute in the public sphere. So nobody was asking, uh, what can you do? So it was just, you know, 
just like that. So more than uh, more than three uh, thousand houses were, were 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 adapted to be schools. They were provided for free for education, and then in these houses, concerning myself from the second. Uh, uh, second class of the secondary school up to finishing my studies, I was a student of this kind of kind of system. But what happened after the war is also how women use different skills or, or actually try to go beyond what they did before uh, to survive, but also to push the boundaries in the very patriarchal uh, societies. I can I can tell the story of a woman of Krusha. It's a village near Jakova, a city of Jakova, where all the men were killed. Uh, uh, so all the village had only only some of the very young boys left, and only women and girls. And then this lady Fahriye Hoti, she started to think that they have to do something because they have to feed their kids. So she collected all the women of the village and they started to, 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 to do agriculture. And now it's a successful story because now you can also uh, see the story of her in the, in the very well-known film, Honey, which, which went to Oscars also uh, last year, I think. Uh, so this is how they made it actually. They had a lot of uh, struggles also with mentality but they went beyond that. And today they export also their products in Europe. You know. Uh, besides that, I could, I could talk about uh, the idea of development in the city as, as uh, 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 it, was, it was mentioned before, being an architect, working at the university, being a part of the Ministry of Education and uh, Ministry of uh, Spatial Planning and, and Environment immediately after the war. Kosovo did a lot on, on legislation, new legislation, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, in line with the EU uh, 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 perspective, but also with the documents which, which, which could be more strategic and inclusive in the sense of being more gender sensitive for uh, more uh, sustainable cities. And in this respect, we worked a lot with UN Habitat, also as a school of architecture, but also with the ministry building capacities in the Ministry of Spatial Planning, but also in every municipality trying to have more directors, uh, women, in the departments of spatial planning or urbanism, uh, and also uh, uh, trying to push women to run for the, for the mayors. Since, since then, uh, since, since uh, up to now, we, ha we had only one woman once in the municipality of Jakova, which was, which was a mayor. Uh, we have a lot of ministers, we have two presidents women, this is good in the central level, but when it comes to local level, it's a bit, it's a bit harder. But when it comes to policy making, gender sensitive cities, uh, gender sensitive parliament, gender sensitive uh, 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 institutions, we have a law uh, on 50-50 uh, 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 representation in every, in every institution. It's an obligation now. But what we have in the, in the, uh, in the uh, how to say, um, in the system of representation within the political parties and within the political institutions, which is uh, the parliament, still we have a quota of 30%. And this is what we're doing today. We're trying to rehabilitate the, the law on gender equality with the law on, on elections. So at least uh, to have 50-50 uh, representation in the list of voting for every party. So to guarantee the representation also in the voting list for women to be half-half. Uh, but the quota is necessity because Kosovo society is undergoing under a lot of changes in a very short time. So still it's not there if I speak about mentality and if I speak about uh, 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 the idea of giving, uh, giving trust to a woman to lead. It's not the same as, as it was 20 years ago. I personally was voted. I didn't enter by quote. And there are a lot of women in the parliament today that entered Kosovo parliament not by quote, but by a number of votes, but quote is still a necessity, so we're still keeping it. Uh, Thank you. I don't know if I can. I'm just aware of the time because. Uh, okay. So okay. If if can, I can stop here. here. I can stop here. Uh, I can just say that what 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 it strikes me in Kosovo is that we have an openness in the idea of women being a part of education, working uh, in, in public institution, but when it comes to the market uh, economy, when it goes out there, outside of public institutions, then the amplitude 
changed a lot radically in a negative aspect because then you have a lot of women studying, for example, architecture, which is more than men. And then when it goes to the market, mm -hmm. uh, the amplitude changes a lot. So you have very few of them, or you have women working for men, but not leading a company or a process. So this is my concern, not just in this profession, but de femmes qui réussissent vraiment dans ce métier-là. Donc, on avance petit à petit. Le Kosovo n'est pas Kosovo n'est Chernobyl. It has a lot of changes also for the positive. Thank you very much. I think it was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. And I think you also that you I think you alight also that the recovery process is a very long-term process. Yes. Especially, yes. you know, you mentioned the aspect of gender-based violence that takes so much time because of the stigma. And uh, can I just add one more thing? So they were added in the law in 2017. Mm -hmm. Because the law on the victims, civil victims of the war, didn't include the victims, sexual violence victims. So we had to amend them in the law. The president Yahyagia did the National Council for addressing this issue with the civil society sector and uh, contribution of different parties. And then we did a lot of pressure between 2014 up to 2017 when this law was amended and they were integrated. Now there is a process, a legal process. It's a legal body within the prime minister's uh, office that deals with the verification, the process up to now. One thousand, more than 1,400 uh, victims, they, they gain their status. Now they have their pension, but it's very sensitive process even in this aspect. Yes, Thank yes, I can, I can imagine. So that's very important so that you mentioned this. Also in relation to Ukraine, yeah. uh, I let uh, maybe I, I invite the, the third speaker. So I would like to give the floor to Tatiana uh, so that we come back to, to the Ukraine context. From the Association of the Ukrainian Cities, also an expert on um, sector recovery and infrastructure. So, if you can a bit also elaborate on your experience, also at the national level, what you see in terms of uh, how the municipalities are are dealing also with the aspect of um, uh, gender equality, and also maybe you can also elaborate on this <coughs> delicate uh, and important aspect of gender-based violence. If there is anything in place, also at the municipality level municipal level to collect the story to um yeah to, to collect and to um, and to register this these experiences uh, thank you julia uh, maybe i can uh, demonstrate some slides uh, if you allow me sure can i Mm, for now, I think I can't. You, you need to be allowed. Uh, I, I can, uh, yeah, so... without uh, slides to start, or maybe uh, if them. you can fix it. For now, uh, I'll wait or... Maybe yeah, I should start. I, I start and then uh, we give you, in the meantime, we try to give you the, the possibility to share your screen. Okay, okay, let me know. Um, as you know, I'm from Ukraine and I'd like to say a few words about the Association of Ukrainian Cities. Uh, it unites 1,009 territorial communities where 90% of Ukrainian population resides. And by the way, 170 women are the heads of these communities, namely uh, 35 city mayors, 78 settlement heads, and 57 village heads. Uh, as we see, there are women in um, uh, ofi uh, officials in a municipal uh, level, but uh, it's uh, more, uh, it's uh, less than a half of all territorial communities. With the beginning of the full-scale invasion, uh, five million people, most of whom were women, uh, saved themselves and their children and the elderly from the war and went to safer, safer regions of Ukraine. And approximately the same number went abroad and received temporary protection in European countries. And while men have joined the military, uh, women are taking on new roles, working multiple jobs and volunteering. 
uh, women, regardless of education and experience, uh, searched for and helped uh, distribute humanitarian aid to communities in the first months of the war, uh, provided and continue to provide support uh, to refugees, uh, took care of uh, animals. Um, these uh, um, singers such as Angelika Rudnitska and business women such as Yulia Savostina and uh, public uh, activists and analysts such as Larissa Pilhun, uh, representatives of various professions and the unemployed. Okay, I see some slides. Uh, could I, uh, or maybe you should switch on. Okay, uh, I'll continue then. Uh, of course, there were representatives of municipalities, heads of territorial communities, and directors of school uh, who organized reception of refugees in territorial communities. Each of us did uh, what we could, and uh, my colleagues, my friend, and for some time, I also helped uh, Red Cross volunteers distribute humanitarian aid, including that uh, collected by Kievans for refugees from the east and south, south of Ukraine, uh, which are the hottest points. Uh, women play an important role in uh, humanitarian response in territorial communities and also continuously helping uh, the military for now. For example, preparing uh, homemade cookies, providing warm clothes and even some military equipment, as Natalia Khuchenkova said. Uh, not only in providing a, a reliable rear, but there are also women at the front line. There are 42,000 women serving in the armed forces, of which 5,000 are on the front lines, according to Deputy Defense Minister Hanna Maler. Uh, for territorial communities, uh, the issue of returning their residents to their homes is acute. Therefore, it is important to restore kindergartens, schools, hospitals, homes for elderly, uh, because without the infrastructure, the amount of unpaid work, which is performed mainly by women, will increase, and this will uh, increase the burden on them. Therefore, it is necessary to ensure that uh, social infrastructure and housing are uh, restored uh, to meet the needs of women uh, in territorial communities. Consequently, the issue of planning for recovery, namely what and how to recover, is no less important and difficult than how to liberate the occupied territories of Ukraine and win this war. It is necessary to plan uh, what to do after the end of the warfare, the occupation, so that residents can return to their homes, to native settlements, and reconstruction and recovery uh, needs uh, as of February 24, 2023, are estimated by World Bank at about uh, 411 billion. Uh, so we can see the scale of the destruction is very considerable. Uh, that require a strategic approach to planning and adequate implementation of recovery plans. Uh, during the war, the regional policy of Ukraine was forced to undergo amendments, uh, thus the law of Ukraine on the fundamentals of state regional policy was uh, supplemented with a system of planning documents of recovery issues at the national, subnational and local levels, and a few functional uh, type of territories the term of recovery territories is used to create uh, effective recovery and development mechanisms. Another law of Ukraine on the regulation of urban, urban uh, planning activities was supplemented with uh, another planning documents such as program for comprehensive reconstruction. Uh, so program of comprehensive reconstruction of the territory of the territorial community should contribute to the implementation of such approaches and practices for the development of territorial communities as anthropocentricity, social justice, national special planning, ensuring the balance of resettlement and placement of workplaces, urban mobility, inclusiveness, environmental friendliness, 
cultural diversity and others. Also, this uh, planning document uh, must comply with the sustainable development goals of Ukraine up to 2030. Uh, the principles of state regional policy are approved in Ukrainian legislation and they include inclusiveness, equal rights and opportunities for women and men, ethnocultural development, cohesion and others. Uh, these principles uh, form the basis of regional development planning documents and the development of regional strategies is uh, carried out on the basis of an assessment of the needs of stakeholders and beneficiaries in the region, assessment of gender impact, as well as taking into account uh, different functional uh, types of territories. Uh, legislation uh, also establishes planning of territories with a barrier-free living environment for persons, but uh, therefore, uh, at the legislative level, appropriate laws regarding inclusive restoration have already been established. But a big challenge for the territorial communities of Ukraine is the restoration of municipal infrastructure, uh, taking into account such legislation. Uh, consult I think that uh, consultations with community at various stages of planning uh, documents development play a significant uh, role in these and that will ensure needs of various interested parties and groups. Uh, but what I can uh, add for now is that um, municipal statistics uh, is uh, uh, at very um, bad uh, state now. Uh, we can't uh, rely on it because um, no relevant uh, information on the local level is uh, uh, enough. It is uh, very little information uh, and uh, more um, non-governmental organizations work on it and gather some information about vulnerable persons, about some uh, cases that had uh, place. Uh, and uh, I can agree with uh, Natalia that, um, Natalia Hutchenko that she said, uh, everybody experience that experience, we, uh, we are not ready for that and uh, every our business every our work for some uh, time should be um, should be not taken into account because uh, the first time was uh, to live and to help uh, our families our elderly children which were Near, our, near us and uh, which we need to take care of. And for some time we uh, take uh, the chance to live further and to plan uh, recovery. Uh, so as for now, I'm working, uh, working at the Association of Ukrainian Cities and uh, I work with uh, municipalities and help them to uh, develop uh, some long-term uh, planning documents uh, that will be not uh, it will be not now, but maybe um, a little more later, and uh, municipalities would uh, develop such documents to recover, uh, to make their cities, villages, and settlement uh, more comfortable to return refugees uh, to them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. I think you, you mentioned an important point also that having the right planning instrument already from, from now. And uh, of course, how to get, we can ensure the involvement of the community when we also face emergency for the construction. So how we can balance and the, the issue of information, having data, enough data and information. I think all of you also uh, share this. Um, so maybe I can now give the floor to Katarina Kresal. I think uh, which has also been a Minister of Interior in Slovenia and uh, I think can share maybe the experience as a minister but also with uh, her uh, European Center for uh, Dispute Resolutions, what are the key priority in fact uh, to take into consideration when we plan for uh, gender sensitive recovery and uh, post-war recovery. 
Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for your introduction. Thank you also to all the presenters before me for this excellent uh, outlining of the issues that are relevant after the post-conflict um, era arrives. They correlate a lot with what I have to say, so I see we have tangled the right things. I come from Slovenia. Slovenia was part of Yugoslavia, uh, and Yugoslavia went under huge, uh, huge changes in the last 35 years, starting with the disintegration of it, then continued with the bloody wars, and, uh, and then uh, uh, ended with uh, forming completely new states, independent, putting uh, everything together from the scratch, you know, coming from socialism to capitalism, uh, coming from one party system to democracy. So there has been decades of processes where women were hugely affected. Either uh, they were made strategic targets of military violence or in post-war, they were completely pushed out of sight. So not included in the government. So we can learn a lot from this uh, painful process, what not to do in Ukraine, uh, for example. And even if Slovenia was that lucky not to have that kind of uh, uh, war conflict like Bosnia, Croatia, Kosovo did, but we still, we still suffered, we were part of that, that was our country, so we followed it very closely. And uh, even though I was 18 years old when this happened, uh, it has lasted many years and the consequences still last. So I will speak about what I found that works and what doesn't work, uh, either from the perspective of um, being there or uh, being part of the Mediterranean Women Mediators Networks that is actually focusing in effective participation of women in peace process processes anywhere in the world, or is either as a first female to become in Slovenia a Minister of Interior and the head of a parliamentary party. So when I when I speak about areas of concern, when we speak about women in post-conflict, there are three areas that I believe that we should address. First is uh, how the women are directly affected by the war. So being victims of the war, suffering from that. Um, and uh, what is really important is, before everything else, that any measure or action plan comes immediately. So when it is possible, so after the conflict ceases, it has to be in place. There's often made a mistake that it's been delayed, but it has to be put in place, it has to start working, it will be amended later on. And the first thing that has to be done is to publicly recognize that women were, part, were, uh, were subjects of criminal acts and that they suffered physical and psychological consequences. And um, we need to offer them psychological treatment and legal protection. For example, in Bosnia, this has been omitted for many years and victims have been waiting for the recognition and later on for the legal first proceedings for way, way too long and they're still waiting. Something similar happened to, to Croatia and, and to other parts, other parts as well. So this is really crucial. But then there's other things that municipalities can do because I will focus on the cities. There's a lot of things that states can do, but at states. Cities can provide for shelters. Natalia mentioned this as probably one of the first things. There were no shelters uh, for women, and that can be done already while the conflict is going on. For uh, those that were affected by violence, with many children with uh, disabilities, and so on. And another, another um, issue that has been uh, mentioned by more women is it is a commonly known fact now that the, the conflicts and the crisis bring up domestic violence hugely. So uh, what cities could do, they could provide for safe houses. That has been proven as a very effective approach. We've had uh, done them in Slovenia as well, not because of the war, but because of the problem of domestic violence. And it is a really welcomed um, measure. And then there's other things. There, there could be um, uh, special medical assistance that could be provided that is not provided within the state after the conflict. And this could be provided through the network of, for example, twin cities or you know, um, you know, cities that the cities of Ukraine work with. Or there could be provided the facilities for a special psychological treatment that where people, where women could be you know, um, anonymous, that could be confidential, or uh, they could be treated uh, without anybody knowing it. And uh, 
lastly, but not definitely not the least, the infrastructure that was mentioned also by, uh, by Elisa, um, that has to be um, uh, adapted to the fact that there's more disabled people, uh, that there has there are sidewalks, traffic lights, public transport, access to other public city infrastructure. This all has to be taken into account when building the state up more. The second, the second area, definitely economic uh, recovery of women, not just of the state, because we all know there's a huge economic gap between men and women in general. And after the conflict, this really increases. So um, the, the municipalities could really work on enabling women to work. So uh, to uh, enabling access to education, I think Natalia mentioned as well how important it was that they could still obtain the education and there were kindergartens. And there could be, um, because it's especially for younger women, those after the conflicts usually or many times are pushed into marrying or they're pushed into taking care of the wider family and they don't go to school anymore. So, you know, promoting this is really important. And um, enabling um, uh, special vocational training where women can really learn skills that are useful immediately and then get jobs and provide uh, provide for their families. Um, uh, uh, having family-friendly working arrangements, like flexible time, off-site work, then maybe uh, fund the, the, the uh, transportation or childcare within the employers. And there's, of course, um, promotion, awareness rising campaigns that can be funded by municipalities saying, well, women can also do these kind of works that men do. We just have to acknowledge that. So this is with respect to getting access to education, but there is also leading with their uh, activities so they can recruit women, they can hire women, they can put them in uh, responsible positions, and they can, of course, introduce quotas. Quotas are anywhere in the world where there is a problem with gender gap, always something that you have to start with. And thirdly, an important thing, uh, enabling finances for women to start uh, their own enterprises. Um, uh, it, was, it was mentioned uh, before how, much, how very necessary it is to be able to start some kind of a business. And some cities have the banks and the financial institutions. They're able to, uh, to make micro credit programs for such things, or they can have targeted investments where they can integrate women and uh, empower them uh, accordingly. And this brings us to, to, to the last thing, but which is maybe even the most important for a long lasting uh, participation of women. And this is opening the doors to, to being part of the decision making processes, to making them part of the post conflict governance. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is known and it has been measured in many analyses that women are the most uh, usual and the biggest victim of wars but they're almost completely less left out of all of the uh, governance processes and decision-making, uh, either from uh, peacemaking to, to after, after war go governments. Uh, and of course, this is something that men really need to hear. This is really wrong, not because of, just because of that, because they are victims, but also because they constitute half of the population and because they bring different problems to the table. They speak about gender issue, they speak about human rights, they speak about how to share power, not just how to keep the power. They speak about education, social services, security issues, and even the most important, they speak in a different way. Uh, women communication, it's proven different than, than men's. It is, it is um, collaborative, it is less assertive, and it is process oriented. And you need to have all these in this in these uh, very fragile times after the conflict and after the war. So what are the measures that, that uh, municipality could take uh, to push to, to women into important processes? Well, uh, it would be great to start with a public pledge on gender equality. This is something that we do, did in Ljubljana in our capital, not for gender equality, but for mediation in uh, dispute resolution. And it proved to be a really great approach. So this is actually a very public act of the municipality saying, we will do everything to secure women participation and the gender equality in everything that we do. And then the action, action plan follows. 
So action plans can be guidelines uh, for the composition of the management bodies of the municipality. It can be mechanisms for inclusion of women, like quotas, recruitment campaigns, or actual appointments to the C positions. Very important, capacity building and training for women. Uh, there is two things that usually lack, either management or leadership skills or political skills. Uh, without them, you can quickly get lost in the high politics. So if this could be given to women at, and be accessible, it would be really helpful. And um, there, nothing happens in this field without a public support. And I speak firstly about media. Uh, Slovenia is a very progressive democratic uh, country uh, and uh, media really struggled with having uh, the first young female minister for home affairs, really struggled with that and being a part of a really important politics because it's something that it's not in the heads. And, you know, working with media, helping them, them understand why this is important, what kind of difference women bring is really really important to welcoming them in the political area in a different way. And of course, the other allies are male politicians. Without them, nothing happens. Either they have to nominate you somewhere or they have to accept you with open arms and um, refuse to use the language that uses the usual bias towards women. So like women are too emotional, uh, women are too hysterical, women are uh, not reliable and stuff like that. So if you have these ambassadors, it will be so much more easier uh, to introduce women to politics um, and municipalities can do a lot in this respect. I will conclude with, uh, uh, with what I found also very important in my Uh, in my, uh, um, reforms that I did in the ministry. Euh, est très importante et a joué un rôle dans les réformes que j'ai faites au ministère. Nous avons inclus. Ah, Moi, включил и також у першу. Before they were passed to the first checks, at the beginning, and that helped us uh, not just gain, of course, uh, support, but also adopt decisions that could really reflect the reality that we in the politics could not could not see so let me start at this place and i will be happy to revisit issues in the discussion thank you thank you for this um, very rich uh, presentation i think you mentioned also the key topics and lessons learned also from your experience and you mentioned of course the role of municipalities so now i would like to to go in fact to the municipality level so i invite uh, the mayor, uh, Renata Kozic, uh, mayor of Domžala, so also we stay in, uh, in Slovenia, uh, so to, to share her experience and, uh, and also her lessons learned. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. First, I would like to thank you for inviting me to be a part of online event, uh, Women Leaders on the Front Lines. Uh, my name is Renata Kosic, and I'm mayor of municipality of Domžale, which is the seventh largest municipality in Slovenia. We have 37,000 citizens, and our main goal is to develop different areas of local community. We pay a lot of attention to the system of civil prevention, uh, protection, and teams who are priceless for our municipality. Uh, I will briefly introduce you the COVID process before, during and after crisis. Uh, our local civil protection is a huge fashion system and it's developing all the time. It includes more than 500 volunteers and professionals and it's divided into different teams and groups. Uh, for example, high quarters. There are 15 people uh, in this, 15, this um, group, there are uh, three women. Then we have professional and volunteer emergency first responses, firefighters, volunteers from Red Cross, scouts, uh, canologists, monteers, and so on. And uh, this is really, I said, a big family in our municipality and really, really important. In the civil protection, especially in high, uh, high quarters, we are highly qualified for crisis communication. We have a lots of training, education, exercises. 
uh, the other teams also have a lot of training because uh, we are aware that good competence and readiness are important for successful intervention in unpredictable natural or other disasters. I've been in headquarters for almost 20 years and I've learned uh, and gained a lot of experiences, especially in crisis communication. Uh, I think that it's really important that women are included in all process, especially in education, team building, training exercises, because in those, those courses, we learn how to deal with crisis, we gain management skills, and we show others that we are capable of managing uh, in hard uh, crisis and also leading the crisis. Uh, in our municipality, women are involved in all process. And uh, I can say that, uh, and all areas, there that we are trying to include them in call, in all kinds of programs in our local community so uh, and we're we'll, we will try uh, to to include them more and more about the covid uh, in march 2020 uh, the world had stopped because we were faced with totally new unknown and really danger virus although we have a lot of experiences uh, in crisis uh, this was new and a nobody, even the state and the institutions didn't know how to deal with. We were faced with a, with a danger virus and we were all highly exposed. Before the uh, epi uh, epidemic was officially pronounced, uh, we began first meetings with mayor and headquarters uh, to decide which activities will be the first. We prepare some actions in local community. In March, the epidemic was pronounced and our first goal was to prevent our citizens and prepare first information about future activities in our municipality. Uh, I think that the most important thing in every crisis is that we immediately prepare the information or, or statement for the public. The information has to be in time, simple, and with all the information that citizens need. I, I think important context of teams and groups uh, and so on. With that kind of activities, we prevent panic among the people and gain their trust, which is the most important thing in every crisis. We had constantly informed our citizens about our actions, where can they found help, and we took a special care for elders and from uh, and for them we prepared um, brochure with all information needed. After crisis, we came to some uh, conclusions. We lead activities successfully. Successfully, uh, The local community and the citizens trusted us. We didn't have problems with them. They follow our instructions and advices. And what the crisis showed us is that we always have to stick together. We must not panic, trust experts, uh, and follow their instructions. And maybe for my conclusion about the women leaders is that, or for us is important, that we have knowledge, we have to be expert in our field, professional, we have to have courage and strength to step forward and tell others and men our ideas and our suggestions. So I, I for my conclusion, uh, in my old, professional time, I didn't have um, bad, I don't know, bad yeah, feeling um, to be a woman. Uh, and the same is, I think, for my colleagues. Thank you. Very good to hear that. So maybe also the Katarina's work also in the country contributed to create this enabling, uh, I think, environment also for women's leaders. I think this, of course, was a very different experience no, from the ones that we have heard so far. But I think uh, you you tell you you told us about your uh, specific experience also to deal with the recent COVID emergency. So thanks a lot. Uh, I think to conclude, uh, we have uh, in fact the the, um, the intervention of uh, Richelle Fortunou uh, from Haiti. But unfortunately, she's with us, so she's listening, but she's sick, so she cannot talk. Uh, so uh, Jamie from CMR. Uh, she will read uh, 
her, her intervention. So thank you, Jamie, also for uh, reading the intervention, which is in French. So I think you need to, if you don't speak French, to go and to listen to the translation. Okay. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I have the main points of uh, what, um, excuse me, what Madame Fortunus wanted to say. So here we go. Je commence en français. Uh, elle disait que c'était un honneur pour elle de pouvoir participer. She said it is an honor uh, for her to be able to participate to this event. As the uh, social and economic situation in Haiti is uh, is quite bad since uh, President Jovenel Moïse passed away in July 2021, especially in the city areas that are confronted with the surge in gang violence and an increase in uh, stories about murders, rapes and uh, forced displacements. And in this uh, gang war, women are usually the scapegoats, and uh, we have dozens of victims. Women and girls are raped by gangs who decide to use them as a tool of terror to get revenge. Sometimes getting access to uh, medical centers and hospitals is dangerous or even impossible. Thousands of women uh, have experienced sexual abuse. The access for those victims to uh, assistance is almost inexistent. Uh, in Haiti, we have the highest um, maternal mortality rate in all of Latin America. And in some areas of the country, it is a downward spiral because of those uh, gang wars because of insecurity. A country without a president is a country on the edge of chaos. Some women rather stay home instead of getting raped in the streets and they're ready to lose their jobs in exchange for their security. Sometimes if they get caught in the streets, they might become the, the property of armed groups. And when they refuse sexual favors, they might face um, counteractions from, from those groups, including murders and uh, criminal arsons, for example. Others have to um, depend on men who are less victim than them in the society. It is a very difficult social situation with a catastrophic uh, scope, unfortunately. Some women uh, suffer sexual abuse coupled with kidnapping or detention. They also lack access to social and medical assistance. A crucial first step would be the rehabilitation of the victims and their access to medical and psychological uh, assistance. They also should have access to justice. It is violence domestic. La perte ou la difficulté à trouver un emploi. Because in the majority of cases, they already have to deal with the loss of uh, a job uh, for them or for their relatives, uh, violence, domestic violence, the loss of livelihood. Uh, in a society where only 30% of women have the right to work, so the task is huge and very complicated. The discrimination is very deep, the discrimination against women, and we have to, to adapt socially. This task is difficult, but not impossible. There was in Haiti what we called lock times, those periods where nothing works, no traffic, no nothing. 
and uh, armed men have actually seized this occasion to uh, break into the house of Richel and they, some of her relatives have been raped, beaten up. So this was a real trauma for her. She had to leave the metropolitan area to go back to his, uh, uh, his uh, to, to her uh, native city. She looked for a job, but she had difficulty uh, finding one. So she just decided to serve her community. And this helped her to feel better, to feel understood. And uh, she said that she didn't want to, to give up and to carry on like this for the, the sake of women in, in her country. Um, statement and also experience. So I'm, I personally, I share also my, my respect and esteem also for the capaci capacity to, to face such an experience and to respond by engaging even more in the community and to support also women. So I, I will open now uh, the floor also to questions. Um, I don't know if you, you can write in the chat or just uh, raise your hand if you have it. If you have anything to, to ask to our speakers. I have, otherwise I can, uh, in the meantime, maybe uh, start with a couple of questions. So I think that from the beginning, uh, already uh, Natalia mentioned two main uh, um, issues no, that have been also repeated uh, over and over. The need for shelter for the victim of violence. So, and of course to fight also domestic violence, to work on this, uh, on, on, the, on the culture and also on, 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 on this. And the second one is really to create a vehicle to support women's entrepreneurship and also learning, this has been said. So I, I ask maybe to uh, Elisa and uh, Madame Oja and then uh, Madame Cresal and maybe possibly also to uh, Madame Melnik to elaborate on maybe one specific example of some initiative that in fact helped uh, women to create their own uh, business, especially in, in time of after the war or during just after the war, and also um, maybe housing project also to, to support uh, uh, women, if you have any, any example to share. Maybe we can start with uh, Elisa. Hi again. Um... As as for concerning the the victims of the war, but also if you speak about domestic violence, women in this uh, in this respect, uh, and also the uh, capacity for developing themselves. Uh, in this occasion, there were different initiatives. Uh, the biggest initiatives are after Kosovo became independent, because before that, uh, there was a provisional institutions of Kosovo. UN administration was here, so it was co quite complicated. But there were a lot of international aid on uh, uh, on uh, trying to to invest uh, on shelter, on uh, uh, social housing, on uh, uh, capacity building, human resources in public institutions, and uh, beyond that in private sector or uh, small businesses. But after 2008, there are specific grants in the Ministry of Economy, in the, in the Ministry uh, for uh, Local Administration, uh, and also uh, recently uh, uh, initiatives from the municipalities uh, of Kosovo. Uh, in this case, I can recall to the municipality of Pristina as a capital city, which had specific grants for women entrepreneurs, startup businesses. Uh, uh, besides that, there are a lot of, uh, still a uh, lot of ongoing projects from international community. I can, I can speak about uh, a, a German NGO help, which uh, helps a lot in this respect for women uh, uh, who, ha who, who have uh, uh, small businesses in rural areas, uh, businesses uh, 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 on uh, small restaurants, pastisseries, uh, milk restaurants, and st stuff like that. So, and also uh, like crafts. Uh, so, it, there is initiative also from the cultural sector to 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 invest on on, on women that 
that use the, or can 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 uh, do something with their with their uh, how to say uh, capacities on on saving the the arts and crafts of traditions in Kosovo, but also generating. In this respect, I can also talk about uh, an NGO which is the Center for Promotion of Women in the municipality of Drenas. It's a very small municipality uh, uh, in the heart of Kosovo. And this municipality hosts a lot of women that are so sexually abused victims. But what they did, because these victims, they gained the status of victims, so now they have pensions. But then besides uh, the fact that they were not educated, they were not employed, it's very hard for them to send money at home because mainly their husbands, they don't know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. So what this NGO did, uh, they, they created a space for creative uh, 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 production. So also different women that are unemployed, they create a lot of necklaces and different things, you know, uh, that they can sell. And, and all these are practically created from, uh, uh, mainly from sexually abused women. So they kind of sort of cover the incomes that they have from their pensions in the idea that they kind of uh, uh, create in this, in this center. So, so the center has a double, double layered uh, uh, function also to kind of bring them together, uh, socialize them and make them useful for themselves and for the society, but also making them easier uh, to kind of cope with the circumstances at home. Uh, and in this respect, I can say that uh, Kosovo has special programs on the, on the uh, incentives that are given for startups in, in, in different uh, uh, economical sector, especially the latest two years and after pandemics, also in the STEM and in IT sector, because uh, there is a lot of women uh, educated now in IT sector outside of Kosovo, but also inside Kosovo. And a lot of companies that are operating like satellite companies with offices in Kosovo, but kind of people of Kosovo working for America or for different companies in Europe, which is good because recently we have a lot of migration going, young people, brain drain, like people going outside mm -hmm. of Kosovo. So this somehow could help people to, to be inside Kosovo, maintain their life, and especially after the two years of very big inflation in Kosovo. So in this respect, I'm not saying it's enough. I'm not saying it tackles every layer of society and every woman in rural areas and in, in the cities, but it is going on. It is going on because also in the municipalities and also in the central level, there are a lot of women that work from the institutions together, as it was mentioned, with many NGOs that have focus on gender sensitive cities, gender sensitive policies and, and decision making processes. So we work together when it comes to gender. There's no Thank political you. party there. So Thank this you. is the thing. Thank you. I'm asking, I'm aware of the time, if one of the other speakers also a specific initiative related to this that would like to share. Please go ahead, Katarina. Uh, uh, maybe to cover domestic violence, um, this is, um, it's been, it's taken like 15 years that domestic violence has become a priority for the high politics. So when I came and took over the ministry, that was actually the first time that the police had to deal with domestic violence in a strategic way. And uh, Elisa will probably remember from times in Yugoslavia, we had no domestic violence. It did not exist because we did not speak about it. Of course there was. Uh, and it's it just like maintained through the, the first years of independence. And so I know nobody dealt with it. It is really important that you put it as a first strategy. And you say, now this is stop. We will have zero tolerance for domestic violence. And we will, of course, adopt all the necessary necessary laws. And uh, we will uh, equip police with all the necessary knowledge to understand how they have to process uh, this, this. And we have, uh, and we have partnered with uh, all the NGOs in Slovenia that have been active in this field. And we were like the, the I was the head promoter of their uh, promotional activities that happened every year. Uh, we also added certain financing to that as ministry 
like really starting to open the eyes of the people and the general public that there is domestic violence, how it is, who are the perpetrators, uh, who are the victims, and how we may not turn ourselves away from that. It is our responsibility to react to that. And I was I was really happy to see that even after 10 years, I'm not there anymore. I mean, this promotion still goes on. And um, it was, of course, adopted heavily by the women working in police. And I've tried really to, to put women in responsible places to deal with that. So it's um, uh, once you put a problem on the high priority of the, of the, let's say, high politics, many things will start changing. So uh, 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 like, my, um, like my colleague said from the, uh, from the municipality of Dunjali, you have to be courageous. And you have to especially be courageous if you are a woman, because um, those measures are completely different than for men, but it can be done. So the things very much changed in Slovenia. Police has this high uh, intolerance to things like that. They know how to react. They know how to behave. It has completely changed. And we did not just stay with the domestic violence. We added also, of course, human rights, human rights protection. Uh, a lot of education of police in this field. A lot of trainings, a lot of uh, good practices, you know, just making those um, uh, people that were not so comfortable with these issues comfortable and understandable and taking them as part of the normal life. Thank you. Uh, I think, yes, the, the sense is what it can be done. I think that's been also mentioned by Madame Fortunus, even in the context of Haiti right now. So I think this is also the fact to be courageous and to be on the front line, in fact, as women, I think is a, at least a positive message uh, that we can share, I think, today. Uh, maybe I want just uh, a last comment, one, one, one sentence, in fact, maybe from the, the other speakers, Renata, and Natalia, and uh, Tetiana. Maybe you can elaborate what is your, could be your message, in fact, to uh, to people and men, especially involved in conflict uh, uh, resolution uh, and negotiations right now, what they should do differently to recognize the role of women. One, one point if you can elaborate. Tetiana, we want to start with you. Um, I agree with uh, previous speakers that uh, NGOs play an important part in that. And uh, public policy is public policy, but NGO uh, take a, a bigger part in that. Thank you. Natalia? Are you still there? Tetiana, are you there? You can uh, can you can you say a final message? Can you share? Okay. Otherwise, if you don't, uh, I don't see you. In fact, uh, I think you are all on mute. Um, but okay, we can maybe conclude. I give the floor to Jamie Just from CMR that can maybe wrap up and uh, and highlight the key. I think uh, messages from from this very interesting and very dense exchange of today. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Julia. I'll do my best uh, to be as concise as possible because, as you said, it was a really rich exchange and the contributions were um, really impactful. So I'm, I'm just even getting a bit emotional over here. So we had three questions to try and sum up today's discussions and one was about what can be transferred across geographies and contexts uh, that are facing conflict or in post-conflict situations and what I've uh, pulled together from what everybody was sharing is um, the importance of working with NGOs that are focused on gender and human rights so for municipalities to really that that, that has been a success factor in all of your stories 
um, that there was a, an element of working together with civil society and NGOs, even though maybe civil society is surviving the best it can in a situation and is being run by volunteers. Uh, I also noted here the importance of prioritizing the reestablishment of the social infrastructure uh, because that has a direct impact on reinforcing women's economic engagement uh, and also children being in school and having a continuous kind of social. Yes, I would like to take text in. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, in 10 minutes, okay. just two, two talks. Sorry. Okay, we'll come back to Natalia after. And then the other thing uh, that can be transferred is also in terms of violence, whether that's domestic violence or uh, sexual violence in a conflict situation, uh, the importance of reporting, having reporting mechanisms, lifting up the stigma uh, and the shame around it, supporting victims, and then of course, access to justice, facilitating access to justice and uh, reparations. Um, I think what's transferable across geographies and contexts really is human caring and solidarity. Uh, women, so not only professionals or elected women, really anyone who's willing to listen, lend a hand uh, to their fellow women in need uh, is something that's transferable anywhere. And uh, thank you, Richel, Madam Fortunis, uh, for, for bringing that up. In terms of what advice comes out today, uh, certainly what Katerina mentioned, zero tolerance for domestic violence, I think is a, a universal advice we could take away from today. Uh, needing to educate and equip the police with the necessary, necessary knowledge to proceed uh, correctly in these difficult situations. Also having gender and accessibility right from the start in reconstruction efforts and the public commitment being essential public commitment to gender equality and also uh, uh, implementing it right away. And thank you for mentioning that, Katerina, because at CEMR we have this equality charter for local and regional governments, and it's exactly that. It's a public commitment, formal commitment that local authorities can make, and then they follow it up with an action plan uh, outlining how they can uh, make, it, make gender equality a reality in their territory even in difficult situations. I would say also having specific grants and funding for women. This was touched on a bit uh, as uh, an important way to include them and to empower them uh, to, to be able to step up and be in those spaces where decision making is happening. And then try, finally, we have the gaps that need to be bridged and who should be involved in those. As I mentioned, there's the NGOs uh, aspect. That could be for uh, filling gaps in data, expertise, and knowing what's needed uh, to respond in a sensitive, gender-sensitive way. Um, another gap would be, yes, the shame and stigma in reporting sexual violence. And I was really interested to hear the idea of involving twin or partner cities to facilitate access to psychological and physical health services. Uh, I would also add here, it was touched on lightly um, by the mayor, of Donzele, male politicians. So for nominating and accepting women in politics and decision-making spaces, I think that they should certainly be involved to bridge that gap. And then finally, maybe there's some more questions about allocation of funds. And I know in certain countries like Ukraine, there are laws about gender responsive budgeting. And are those laws, for example, being taken into account or influencing uh, work with donors? for reconstruction. I think that this could be an interesting path to develop uh, going forward. So with that, uh, last comment, Natalia told us bravery has no gender and women are undeniably on the front lines. Natalia, did you want to say one last word? Um, thank you for read. I'm sorry, I'm the airport just uh, having my way from the sister cities. We, we just visited our new sister cities, Rams, uh, France and Aachen, Germany, where there was a Karl Prize Award and our city, it's a great honor for us, we are presented like a sister city of Aachen, it's a new partnership and also like a good signal for all residents and uh, also all women that we are not alone, we that are supported, we that all together and we hope to be a real part of European family and to, to have such 
sisters, European sisters, which will inspire us and give us strength and force to resist further. So just thank you a lot for it. Thank you so, so much, Natalia, and congratulations. Keep up the good work. We look forward to hearing uh, good news reports from you coming up. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So yes, as you said, bravery has no gender. We, women are on the front lines, whether that's in their home, with their families, in their communities, or in a conflict in the military. So we need to translate that into being on the front lines of decision making and being at the heart of peace, mediation, negotiations, and uh, redevelopment. So with that, that concludes our session today. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking the time to share in a really honest uh, way your experiences, your insights. I'd also like to thank the interpreters who are with us today who were able to make this um, as inclusive as possible a session. And we actually do have uh, two events coming up. One that's not so directly related to today's theme, uh, Cities Alliance is organizing next week a workshop with ECDPM about uh, empowering women with water and a focus on the Middle East North Africa region. You'll see that that link to that has been shared in the chat. So that's next week on 24th of May from 11 to 25th. 1 p.m. 25th of May. 25th, oh, my notes are bad. 25th of May. Thank you, Julia. And then uh, for CEMR, we would like to also continue to see how we can contribute to creating a space for exchanges like this between women uh, from different regions who have been involved in, in conflict, crisis, and who are looking at recovery. So we are doing a hybrid event in Tbilisi, uh, the Eastern Neighborhood Equality and Women's Solidarity Forum. So we're being hosted by the National Association of Local Authorities in Georgia. And I will put the link to join there. It'd be great if you could join us in the discussion. And if any of the panelists from today, if you would be interested to participate, also uh, to speak up from the floor, don't hesitate to reach out. Julia or Pietro, I cannot share the link. We already okay. shared in the chat. Ah, um, uh, for, the, for the CEMR event. And I'll see you no. Okay, I can. Sh I'm going to share it with the hosts and panelists, and then if you can share up, oh, yes, done more broadly to the group. Okay, so thank you again. This was a um, really touching exchange. I don't know if Julia, if you have any last comment to make, but it's it's been a no, real pleasure. I would like to to thank. Of course, it was also our we we worked as I said also on, on the topic of gender. We worked on fact on gender and, and cities and specifically in Ukraine. But this was also the first attempt also to create a space of, for sharing experiences. I think of course the experiences were kind of very different. So maybe next time we'll do something more focused on a specific topic that we want really to exchange upon. Uh, but thanks a lot. It has been really very rich conversation and we'll be in touch soon. So thanks a lot to all the speakers and uh, and everyone that participated today. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.